Greetings and welcome back to room 303 of the Harvard Classics Lecture. This is lecture number 69. We now turn in our Harvard Classics volume number 9. We're going to be looking at uh, a couple of essays by Cicero on friendship and on old age. We're going to look at the uh, some of the letters that we have of Cicero. And then finally we're going to look at uh, uh, Pliny the Younger, as he is referred to, and some letters by uh, him as well. Now, we move, of course, from uh, Greek drama to what we might think of as Roman drama of a kind, although not specifically drama. Uh, when we look at the, especially the letters of Cicero here, we'll talk about that one in a moment. Now, there's always debate any time you put together a selection of texts. And of course, when Charles Eliot did this to publish in 1909 for the Harvard Classics, huge debate. For example, uh, let me get this straight. So you've got a selection of some of the writings of Cicero and Pliny, but for example, you've got no Seneca, you've got no Juvenal, you've got no Horace, or we'll get to this one here in a couple of more volumes. You've got two volumes of Charles Darwin, both Origin of Species as well as The Voyage of the Beagle, but you do not have Homer's Iliad as a single volume. Well, this is always going to be the debate and we'll enjoy it as we go. Of course, for our purposes, we have lectures already on the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. The, the Odyssey and the Aeneid are part of, uh, of the Harvard Classics, as is uh, the Divine Comedy of Dante, right? But we want to make sure that we pay attention to what we have and celebrate what we do have in the Harvard Classics, okay? So we're going to look at Cicero's letters, we're going to look at the letters of Pliny. Now, why is that important? Well, I think it's, a, I think it's significant because we're working now with, when you're talking about letters, you're talking about a way to study history. We'll say this at the end of our lecture. It's a great way to study history is to look at the letters. You learn a lot about a person, but you learn a lot about the spirit of the age, as, uh, as maybe we'll say it, okay? Now, um, uh, you need to go back, uh, if you haven't done it, and take a look at my earlier lectures for the Harvard Classics on LearnStrong.net. Go down that left-hand side, find that folder there. I've given all kinds of lectures. Um, of course, when we talk about the power of the great Roman uh, people and, of course, the Republic first and then later the Empire, um, we, we'll say already that really, other than with Marcus Aurelius, we haven't met any Romans other than, we might say, of course, St. Augustine, who lived in uh, Romanized Hippo, Christian, uh, Christian Romanized Hippo in North Africa at the time. Let's just remind Again, what our learning theory stipulates for 303, we're constantly trying in 303 to match new information to old information in meaningful ways. That's big for us, right? Uh, of course, we do that through our reading in the form of annotation. We answer our three guiding questions. What does the text say? Level one. What does the text mean? Level two. Here we divide 2A messages, themes to be rhetoric. Not what the poet says or the writer says, but how he or she says it. And then finally, level three, how can I relate to this information in 3A? How can I relate to this to other texts that I know, and then finally, how can I relate this to myself? We'll turn now to uh, just outline the lecture so that we have some sense of it. I'm going to go ahead and do in a single lecture, <coughs> excuse me, all of the work of, um, of Volume 9. Um, we're going to start first of all with Cicero, and then we'll move to Flenay. We'll do background information on Cicero, then we'll talk about his first, the essay on friendship, then we'll do his essay on old age, which I'm going to argue is truly one of the great classics of all time. We'll talk about maybe why. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the letters, and then we'll move on to the letters of Fleming, okay? Um, I think this is an amazing choice. I mean, when Mortimer Adler compiled his great books uh, set, uh, we mentioned it many times already, there was no Cicero uh, included, and I think that I think that's important um, that we that we do enjoy Cicero. So let's turn really quickly. We'll do some brief background information. Obviously, we're always doing epidermal background here as we go. Born thir uh, 3 July 106 BCE, dies 7 December 43 BCE. I mean, think about that. That's the year after Caesar gets cranked on the Ides of March by his pal Brutus and the rest of them, right? Um, we're going to call him a Roman statesman, uh, that is to say a politician, an orator. That's huge. Put that one in your notes because he really does kind of stand for what it means when we talk about Roman oration. The lawyer and, of course, a philosopher for reasons we'll get into. Uh, serves as counsel in the year of 63 B.C. Really, Romans, Rome's greatest orator and pro stylist, prodigious influence on the Latin language, and we should say on English prose as well. Uh, he introduced Romans to the different schools of Greek philosophy. He's a big supporter of conservative values, especially of the Republic, 
and after Julius Caesar's death, he becomes an enemy of Mark Anthony, and then the second triumvirate will proscribe him. He ended up on a prescription list, and he's executed by soldiers uh, 43 BC on the 7th of December. Um, his hands were chopped off, his head was displayed, the tongue extracted, you know, all this kind of stuff. The, the Romans, right, in the Roman form, they love to do this kind of thing. His influence, though, is prodigious. The great um, um, Italian writer Petrarch discovers the letters of Cicero, publishes them, and in the 14th century really is in many ways the beginning of the Renaissance movement and humanism. Uh, it, it some have, in fact, called the Renaissance the revival of Cicero. So it's an advantage for you to have some working familiarity with I mean, who are we talking about when we talk about Cicero. Well, in many ways, he's responsible for much of what happens in the Italian Renaissance. Okay, let's turn now to two of his essays. The first one on friendship, um, and I think this one is a fascinating little essay, and you're gonna, you're, you, I think you're gonna be impressed with some of the things that he has to say. Um, uh, uh, Lalivus on friendship is the formal title. Um, the dialogue here that Cicero said he heard, this is kind of like Plato, right? Um, um, in the dialogue early on, Phineas will ask Lilius, how are you dealing with the death of your pal Scipio? Um, and of course, Scipio is really important in the history of Rome. And now we're gonna get into the keys uh, to friendship. Let's go through these quickly and then we'll look at some of the lines from the text itself. Um, the first thing he says is that friendship can only exist among good men who live in honor, justice, liberality, and they follow nature. In other words, uh, friendship, true friendship only happens between equals. Uh, he says that perfect conformity of opinion is a hallmark uh, of friendship as well on all subjects. By the way, one of the reasons why we study old texts, classics, we'll call them, is so that we can begin to kind of get a sense, have things changed in a postmodern world that we live in today, or some call it a post-postmodern world. Right? Obviously, some of us will say, well, I don't think that to have, a, to have a true friendship, we've got to agree on all points. In fact, I, some of my best friends, we by definition don't agree on all points. That's what makes us such great friends. Uh, a third observation is that friendship for Cicero transcends everything else. It gives hope, it overcomes despondency and sadness, um, he makes this observation about friendship that it's not of self-advantage, but rather it's recognized even by animals as being something for the other. Um, the rule of friendship is never make disgraceful requests, never grant disgraceful requests. In other words, one of the things that Cicero is going to say is if a person asks you, who you call a friend, asks you to do something that's wrong or immoral, that individual is not your friend by definition or he or she would not make that request, right? Um, he, he puts out several mistaken views of friendship, which are fascinating. Uh, he says, one, um, of, um, you, you, should, you should not feel towards your friend exactly how you feel towards yourself. <clears throat> and the reason is because we do things for our friends we, we might never consider doing for ourselves, sacrifice in any number of ways. Um, a second one, he says, kindness to a friend should be in proportion to his or her kindness to us. This is a monumental mistake because he says friends should always be generous. In other words, I should be willing to do for you things that maybe you don't necessarily want to do for me as a friend and vice versa, right? Uh, finally, he says we should act upon our friend's estimate of themselves. Well, this one is definitely patently wrong because sometimes our friends will think lowly of themselves and uh, of all three of these principles that are wrong, this is the, the, the one that for uh, Cicero is really the, 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 the one that's ultimately wrong. Uh, in true friendship, no unrestricted communication. We should be able to tell our friends everything, which is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, Scipio said men care more about their sheep and their goats than their friends, which is tragic. In other words, this argument, and Cicero is always going to make this argument, you have to nurture the friendship, and we care more about other things than we do about our friendship, which is, I think, an interesting 3B question. Is it the case in your life that you've often cared less about Taking, developing and taking care of your friendships, then you have cared about other kinds of things, which are kind of silly and probably maybe go away or whatever. Um, he says that you should choose your friends considering constancy, solidity, firmness. In other words, um, will they be around when bad stuff happens? And he talks a lot about breaking, at the end of the dialogue, breaking off friendships. He says you should do it gradually and avoid animosity if you've got to get rid of a friend, right? So, for example, you've been friends through high school, now you're graduating, you're going on to college, and you recognize that that friendship is probably not going to last, and so you begin to kind of sever. How, how should you do that? Kind of gradually instead of just saying, okay, we're no longer friends anymore. Right. 
he does talk about the organic nature of friendship and the ways in which friendships kind of form or they kind of die in some kind of natural or organic way most of the time. He does say that you should enter into friendship with the greatest care. You should avoid in any way adulation or flattery as well within your friendships. And he says comradeship has within it all that men most desire and women we would say today obviously. It is interesting though to point out for your notes there, there is no mention about women being friends in Cicero's um, um, dialogue but rather it's uh, friendship is between, between males. Well, let's go now to the text itself, paragraph number four, section, not paragraph, uh, section number four. He says, I am not one of these modern philosophers, the, the, the conservative Cicero, who maintain that our souls perish with our bodies and that death ends all. Now, this is crucial to his understanding both of friendship as well as his understanding of old age. Uh, Cicero very much believes in the idea of the immortality of the soul, a la Phaedo, uh, Plato's Phaedo, and so um, he, he will begin there. He makes this observation. He says, therefore, for a set discourse on friendship, you must go, I think, to professional lectures. All I can do is to urge on you, he's speaking to, young, to, to a couple of young people, urge on you to regard friendship as the greatest thing in the world, for there is nothing which so fits in with our nature or is so exactly what we want in prosperity and adversity. So, in other words, he says, the most important thing uh, that you can do is to gain a good friend and to have good friends. Uh, the next observation, that I, and, and again, guys, I wish I had more time and I could go through this in detail, but I've got to cover a lot of territory here, so I'm going pretty quickly. In, in uh, passage number six, um, in section six, he says, now friendship, may be thus defined, okay, here we go, a working definition of friendship, a complete accord on all subjects, human and divine, joined with mutual goodwill and affection. Again, that kind of one-to-one -one correspondence, we basically agree about, about everything. And while we maybe would argue that's not necessarily the case, we might argue that at our fundamental level, our closest friends are the people who share our same values and kind of agree with us. And, fundamental levels. And I mean, if you'll think back, uh, well, play this game. When was the last time that you had a friendship that you thought was a friendship and it ended up ending? What is it that ended it? You might say that it was a difference in a fundamental core value. And you decided, you know what, I just can't do this anymore with this individual because we don't share that common core value. That, I think, is what Cicero is going to, uh, is going to suggest, okay? Um, the next thing I'll say, uh, or I'll point you to, is in um, section 7, he says, if you don't see the virtue of friendship and harmony, you may learn it by observing the effects of quarrels and feuds. Why do people fight? Well, they obviously are not in harmony, that is to say they're not friends. And I think this is a fascinating idea. If you're constantly fighting and bickering with someone, Cicero says that individual is not your friend. It might be an acquaintance, it might be a colleague, but definitely... Definitely not, not a friend. Um, I'll jump to the next one uh, here in, uh, passage, in passage 9. He says, we shall get the most important in uh, material advantages from friendship. It's the origin from a natural impulse rather than from a sense of need. Uh, friendships, he says, are eternal. Uh, the world, he says, the most difficult thing in the world was for a friendship to remain unimpaired to the end of life. That's a fascinating idea. You can't buy friends, he says, and they're hard to hold on to. And again, one of the reasons why we love to look, read texts like this is that we can ask, is, does this make sense to us? At level three, is this an idea that I can, I, I can kind of work with? I had students that took a look at this essay and said, I never really thought critically about my friendships. They, they were kind of the thing I did. Now that, now that Cicero's raising this, it makes me now begin to think, and I think that's probably a, a, a good idea. Um, the the uh, next place I'll take you uh, really quickly, and again, I've said this in all of my lectures, I hope that you pick this thing up and you read it on your own. Um, in uh, part 13, he says, the wisest choice is to hold the reins of friendship as loose as possible. You can then tighten or slacken them at your will. In other words, don't jump in to an early acquaintance and, and make this individual a dear friend to totally trust this individual until time right, has gone on. Um, and trust, of course, is a huge part of understanding the value of friendship, right? Because we need to be able to trust in our life. Uh, he, he says in uh, passage 15, he says, uh, who can love one whom he fears or by whom he knows that he is feared? In other words, true friendship 
is not built around some notion of power dynamics. A true friendship, and this is why, for example, Cicero would argue that he, um, you, you can never be a true friend, friend with your parent because there's a power dynamic involved there. Or you can never be a true friend with your teacher or whoever. Um, the idea here is that true friends are equals, right? And you have to be equals in terms of issues of power and the like, right? No fear. Um, we're, we're reminded of that First John, uh, for those of you who are biblical readers, First John 4, 18, I hope that's all of you. First John 4, 18 says perfect love casts out all fear, right? It's an interesting idea. Um, the next place I'll take you is over to passage 17. He says, um, he quotes Aeneas on this one, and he says, uh, the hour of need shows the friend indeed. If you've ever heard that term, that, that phrase, a friend in need is a friend indeed, um, this, is, this is the origin of kind of where it comes from. This is, you know, an interesting idea as well. You know your true friend when you're in the middle of some seriously bad stuff and all of a sudden somebody steps in and helps you. That might be evidence of a solid friend if, as opposed to somebody who kind of runs away or whatever. Um, he speaks of the, um, a, the golden rule in friendship um, in uh, passage 19. He says, put yourself on a level with your friend, right? Um, in other words, it's, it's almost that golden rule idea of do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Do to your friends what you would hope your friends would do to you. Boy, oh boy, wouldn't that solve a lot of our problems in, uh, in, in, at World in High School if we could just kind of practice that one, right? Um, I'll, I'll move on quickly here. Uh, the next passage that I wanted to point out to you is from um, uh, passage 22. Um, there's a lot of great stuff here. I, I would highly recommend, again, the whole essay, but certainly 22. The fair course is first to be good yourself and then to look out for another of like character. Now, this is going to be huge for Cicero. He's going to say that if you are an immoral, unethical person, you're not going to be able to sustain friendships. Because sooner or later, that individual is going to no longer trust you, and create, this creates kind of obvious problems. Um, the next one, first of all, he says to rule those passions which enslave others, and then in the next place, to take, to, to take delight in fair and equitable conduct, to bear each other's burdens, never to ask each other for anything inconsistent with virtue and rectitude, and not only to serve and love, but also to respect each other. Wow, what an amazing line. I mean, serve and love, but also respect. If you can't respect somebody, you can't be that somebody's pal, real friend, in other words, is his point, right? I say respect, for if respect is gone, friendship has lost its brightest jewel. I mean, what a great line, right? I mean, if you no longer respect an individual, it's very difficult to have any real abiding friendship. Uh, to continue over uh, on into this passage 22, again, it's an amazing passage. He says, uh, Wherefore I must again and again repeat, you must satisfy your judgment before engaging your affections, not love first and judge afterwards, right? We suffer, he says, from carelessness in many of our understandings in none more than in selecting and cultivating our friends. We put the cart before the horse. And you may be wondering where that phrase came from. It's here. We put the cart before the horse and shut the stable door when the steed is stolen in defiance of the old proverb. For having mutually involved ourselves in a long-standing intimacy or by actual obligations, all on a sudden, some cause of offense arises and we break off our friendships in full career. I mean, just think about the way in which that line, I mean, I've had students that say, man, I wish I had, I wish I had studied this information when I was younger and really been taught how to choose friends, all right? So, um, and I think it's a worthy, I think it's a worthy activity to begin to critique your friendship in some way. Um, he says, I say that without friendship, life is no life. Well, your uh, your your life is sustained by the friends that you have. Hmm. Um, uh, the last one, uh, it, the very final words of this one are, there are people who owe more to bitter enemies than to apparently pleasant friends. The former often speak the truth, the latter never. In other words, he says, um, it's, it's really important that your friends have the freedom to tell you what they really think. And if somebody pays you the compliment of truth, because if your friends, all they do is flatter you, Cicero says, those are not true friends. But if somebody really tells you the truth, let me tell you what I really think. 
Maybe your first instinct is to be mad, but I think after time, Cicero says, after, after some consideration, you may actually decide, you know what, that individual could have you know, flattered me and instead told me the truth, and for that I owe, I owe uh, him or her a, 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 a congratulation, a compliment, a thank you. Well, let's hurry now to 2A. Well, obviously, to be, uh, to be a true fan, first you have to be a friend to yourself. That's what he means by virtue, and then you can be a friend to others. Uh, there's nothing more important than friendship, and of course, you are who you hang out with or who you're friends with. Now, that is an interesting debate. We'll get to it in 3B. You know, many times parents will say, you need to stop associating, or adults in your life who care for you, will say to you, you need to stop associating with those people. They're not your friends, and you need to stop because you become who you are like. Um, if, if you really want to upset most young people, critique their friends in negative ways. And yet Cicero says, that's exactly what you should do. You should think most critically about the people who you most associate with and ask two questions. Are they friends to me, real friends, and am I a real friend to them? In other words, do they have the kind of values that I want in my life? I, I once shared this essay with a student, and she had to admit that the people she was associating with were asking her and challenging her to do some things she felt uncomfortable about doing, but she went ahead and did them anyway, peer pressure we call that, right? And once she, once she heard Cicero, she was like, this is unhealthy. It's unhealthy for me, it's unhealthy for them. For me to say, for example, to somebody else, um, you know, I'm not going to do what you want me to do, and I don't think that's true friendship anyway. And so she made the decision, she, she, she said it out loud, and she severed the relationship with an individual who, that individual then was first offended, really mad, spread all kinds of nasties, three years later came back in the senior year and said, you know what, you were right, I was wrong, and I can see by your life, and your life's choices versus my life choices, that I should have probably followed your lead, and I didn't, and I apologize, said it right before graduation day. Quite, quite interesting. Cicero would have applauded the, you know, the fact that, this, that this, both of those students learned